Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gashav Parvez, and welcome to the Cyber Exchange Healthcare X opening panel discussion. Today, we'll be discussing uh, pandemic attacks on healthcare organizations and how it has changed the healthcare landscape from a cybersecurity perspective. Uh, today, I'm joined by three other wonderful panelists uh, who will be joining me. But uh, before we get into that, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Gashif Barvez. I am currently the Chief Information Security Officer, CISO, at the University Health Network. Uh, and in that capacity, uh, I'm responsible for uh, cybersecurity operations uh, and uh, governance, as well as the cybersecurity program. Uh, for the largest uh, hospital group within Canada uh, and largest research hospital in Canada as well. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce my fellow panelists uh, right now. Uh, we've got uh, Daniel uh, Pinsky uh, from CDW. Maybe you want to take a minute to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Daniel Pinsky. And uh, like I said, I work for CDW Canada. My role there is I actually manage the information security program uh, across the organization. Uh, prior to CDW Canada, I was at CIDC for about 10 years. And there I worked in various roles um, from governance uh, to internal audit all the way to risk management. Wonderful. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, and next, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Huda Nasiri. Uh, and she's from KPMG, I believe. Uh, Huda? Uh, thanks, Kashif. So my name is Hoda Nasseri. I'm a cyber defense manager in KPMG Canada. Uh, prior to joining KPMG, I was working in Security Operations Center in Deloitte. And uh, before that, I was a researcher and lecturer in uh, HEC uh, Montreal Business School. Uh, right now, and now I'm focused on uh, cyber threat intelligence. And uh, I've been uh, very fascinated with the changes to the healthcare industry and the changing and evolving threat landscape since the beginning of the pandemic. Wonderful, wonderful. And then our third panelist is uh, Ali Shahidi. Uh, Ali, you want to introduce yourself? Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Ali Shahidi, and I'm the Director of Information Security Management and Privacy with Ontario Health, uh, basically which is a super agency was uh, created a year and a half ago. And I'm uh, basically one of the uh, senior leaders in that domain, working with uh, for both privacy and security in the areas that we have uh, on operation side and strategy and tactical uh, work that we do for uh, Ontario Health, which involves about 20 agencies or so business units we call, including the LINS and uh, uh, cancer care and e-health and all of it. Uh, business units. Wow. And prior to that, I've been uh, with both private and public sector, all the way from uh, IBM to PwC and uh, Deloitte even, and then uh, with the uh, uh, higher education sector, and um, been in the area for a few years. Wonderful, wonderful. So as you can see, we've got a uh, great panel with us today. Um, and I'd like to just uh, jump right into it, because I know that this is going to be a uh, wonderful discussion. So. Uh, you know, everyone knows the world has changed with, uh, with COVID-19 and the pandemic. Uh, so, um, and a lot of businesses have, to have had to adapt, but uh, arguably uh, one of the, the most impacted businesses has been the healthcare sector. Uh, so maybe I'll uh, throw the question out there first, uh, maybe to Daniel. Um, so how has actually, uh, has COVID-19 and then the pandemic itself changed uh, operations within the healthcare uh, sector? So how, how has it actually fundamentally changed the business? For me, um, look, at the end of the day, bad guys are opportunists. So yes, there's been an uptick in things like phishing and, and ransomware. And um, there have been, uh, again, an uptick in um, vulnerabilities or people looking for vulnerabilities in things like Citrix, WebEx. So the types of tools that uh, a remote coworker would use. Um, Honestly, for me, I think the biggest uh, change that there's been is actually from a, a social or team point of view. And I, I think as organizations, one of the things that um, we thrive upon is actually um, being with other people and building relationships. And now that a lot of us are working from home, 
if not uh, more of the time, all of the time, uh, there's a camaraderie or a friendship that I think has really suffered. I know in, in our relationship, uh, people who would uh, describe themselves as extroverted all the way to people who would des describe themselves as introverted. Um, the one thing that everybody is saying across the board is, is that they miss coming in the, in the office. They miss seeing their friends. They miss building those relationships. And at the end of the day, anything that an organization or ourselves are going to accomplish or want to accomplish, it's not going to happen without the help and support of people. Um, so for me, I would say the biggest uh, impact has certainly been on the social, the social side. Uh, so maybe I'll, uh, I'll jump in first before I get it over to uh, Huda and Ali. Uh, so I guess from, from my perspective, I guess being at, a, at the hospital on the front lines, uh, uh, so what we've seen uh, ourselves has been uh, just that, I guess, the, uh, uh, some of the, the work that was normally done uh, at the hospital, things like uh, uh, services that were delivered inpatient, uh, they've quickly had to try to uh, switch those to being uh, virtual care and that sort of uh, uh, way. So um, things that don't require uh, hands-on, I guess, uh, work from the, from the clinicians, uh, that has uh, quickly had to change to becoming a virtual type of uh, visit. So people who didn't have to come in uh, to, the, to the hospital, they were uh, asked not to. So, so I think that was the biggest thing. To do that, there was a, a bunch of different um, technologies and different types of uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, technologies such as you mentioned, mentioned Citrix and other things uh, to provide that. Uh, and then they come with their own uh, sets of vulnerabilities and security holes that we had to uh, quickly address. Uh, so maybe I'll now flip it over to Ali to, to uh, take a stab at this. Sure. Uh, you're right. Uh, basically, once this has started, the problem we faced was in multiple fold actually. And uh, it was all the way from the patient care and the, the, the service delivery to the uh, to the corporate side and how we could manage and we could operate uh, very seamlessly. And uh, we, we had some challenges in that area, especially we weren't ready for a virtual care uh, service providing and delivery at the beginning, and we needed to jump on many different aspects. And the biggest challenge became that once we are in the healthcare, the, the path, only the, as you probably all know, uh, it's quite a complex environment, and it's not just one entity that can handle things. Because healthcare across province, uh, where we are, uh, it's spread among among many different players, and it can be service providers that are uh, on the private side providing healthcare, uh, basically services to the patients, as well as the provincial level type of agencies or hospitals that we have been working with, and uh, providing them the, the back uh, the back end support. So uh, that was the challenge, and uh, the, uh, one of the very first things that we had started with realizing that the virtual uh, basic care service delivery part became essential for uh, our, especially from Ontario Health point of view, we had to uh, uh, wrap up the, the, uh, the capabilities and the technical side and technology side to, in order to deliver that. Having said that, at the same time, we are dealing with, we have been dealing with privacy aspects, we have been dealing with, the, again, the, the opportunistic type of attacks that have started right away at the beginning, and uh, all the way from the phishing attacks to the ransomware, and going through the, uh, the again, even the, the ritual sessions that we have, like a Zoom, because m many of these uh, service providers started looking for uh, solutions that might not be uh, basically built for the, uh, the healthcare system uh, and uh, what we do in this sector. So all of this became a part of the challenges day to day from day one that we started uh, dealing with this pandemic and uh, as of today still we are uh, dealing with some of them. While everything else was pretty much put on hold uh, somehow, some of the longer term type of uh, projects like uh, OHDs that Ontario Health teams which were supposed to uh, start working and uh, going through for uh, different hospitals and service providers. Now, uh, all of them pretty much have been put on hold and uh, we are trying to just manage what we have to do right now and survive uh, this stage of uh, this pandemic. Wonderful, wonderful. Great answer, thank you. Uh, Huda, you want to uh, jump in on this? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so, uh, 
since the beginning of the pandemic, I've been uh, following the evolutions and changes to the healthcare sector and the threat landscape very closely since our team had a regular uh, publication on the threat landscapes to help companies to make sense of the uh, changes that are happening. Uh, uh, so uh, I think uh, what has happened is that the pandemic has actually uh, accelerated the, the trends that were already there. Uh, so, uh, for example, telehealth has been there for decades, but the adoption was very slow. Uh, things that would normally have taken uh, years uh, to uh, accomplish and now have, uh, have been happening uh, only uh, over a few months. So I actually uh, I uh, dug up some statistics around it, and uh, interestingly, uh, I realized that the uh, request for uh, virtual consultations uh, in the U.S. only in March uh, has been uh, increased by 10 percent, which is a lot. So the healthcare sector had to scramble to meet this demand. And the uh, projections is that by the end of 2020, uh, over uh, uh, the uh, uh, virtual care interactions will increase by uh, 1 billion in the United States. Mm -hmm. So with this uh, very a fast uh, change in the adoption of telehealth. As uh, Ali also mentioned, there has been uh, uh, more you know, exposure and increase in the attack surface of the uh, healthcare. Uh, so since uh, healthcare sector has been, uh, has had to quickly launch uh, online video conferencing uh, platforms, had to send some of their you know, uh, workforce to work from home, the ones that are, for example, the researchers, people who could actually work from home. So they had to uh, set up work from home uh, infrastructure very quickly. So they had to ban some privacy and security uh, rules. They didn't, they weren't able to enforce uh, some of security, privacy and compliance uh, uh, rules and policies uh, at that time. So this had uh, uh, exposed them more to the attacks. Uh, at the same time, uh, attack, uh, you know, uh, threat actors uh, have also uh, uh, changed their focus to this sector during the pandemic. At the beginning of the pandemic, some uh, prominent ransomware groups said that they won't uh, attack healthcare sectors, but the sector, but they didn't uh, keep their their promise, and uh, because probably they thought that. Uh, you know, organizations that normally wouldn't pay ransom, now they have to do that because they want to keep uh, operating and they can't really, uh, uh, you know, uh, help uh, any disrupt, help dealing with any disruption in their operations. Uh, so, uh, so you have the vulnerability, uh, vulnerability side that was more for the healthcare sector and at the same time the threats and attacks were more as well. The other uh, dramatic change that has happened to the healthcare sector is that uh, the interest that threat actors and state-sponsored uh, threat actors has actually uh, taken in this uh, sector. Maybe before that, nobody really cared about the uh, health institution, I mean, or a university or a data of a lab, but now these are very precious targets for nation states. Uh, so. Yeah, so this is another front that healthcare has uh, been uh, has have to deal with since the beginning of the pandemic. So, uh, thank you. That was a great, uh, great uh, analysis there, uh, Huda. And I think that speaking as a uh, as a CISO of a, of a hospital, uh, you're right on. Uh, so we do have various uh, rules in place, various policies and procedures for the security and the privacy. Uh, and one of them, you know, for uh, just an example, uh, is that. Uh, uh, traditionally, uh, you know, uh, remote access, VPN access, and that sort of thing is is given on machines that are that are that are owned and operated by our own organization. Uh, the need for virtual care, the need for specific uh, uh, users who normally uh, are always in the at the hospital setting, uh, they don't normally work from home or remotely. Uh, they needed to get on right away to get access to clinical applications, to other things. Uh, and, uh, you know, they don't necessarily have managed, what we call managed machines, machines that are controlled by our organization. So, um, you know, uh, in a pandemic, uh, sort of a lot of these 
uh, I'll say, policies need to be bent a little bit uh, in order to pro provide the care to the people. That that's sort of the, the more the more important thing, anyway. Um, that, that being said, I mean, we haven't uh, sort of thrown security out the window or anything like that. Uh, what we've had to do is adapt a bit. And uh, so you can't say no, so you allow this in. What you do uh, are able to do is uh, uh, up your inc increase your monitoring capabilities as the VPNs come in. You up that, you monitor, you uh, increase your uh, sort of response, incident response procedures uh, to sort of make them more automated and, and, and quicker to respond. Uh, should something arise, but uh, but yeah, the, the days of uh, I guess staying no, you can't do that right away. Uh, those things are long behind us, and uh, I think that's what I've seen uh, from the front lines. This is like you know true operational stuff. So maybe anyone else want to chime in on on that perspective? Um. If, if I may, yes, I, I, you're 100 percent right. Uh, due to this pandemic, we uh, we had to change how we operate and how we go through the process and procedures that we have for security and uh, basically accepting and uh, the, the doing the due diligence on some of the activities and the projects and the plans. Uh, because we were dealing and we have been dealing with actually human's life and which can override uh, pretty much everything else uh, when uh, we talk about that. And even IPC from uh, the first point of view, they gave uh, some leeway for that saying that, you know what, we know we are in a difficult time and we need to uh, work to make sure that, so uh, as even Hoda was mentioning, so for some of these activities that would take months, we had to approve something, for instance, or review and they get to the point. Uh, where we did it actually one of them, it was about two weeks. We had to uh, implement uh, uh, for the visual care home delivery for all of the links we are talking about. And that had to be done in two weeks, which translated in pretty much 24-7 uh, work on it, making sure that we have everything proper in place. The other challenge when it comes to that it was has been the, the uh, at the same time the IT side and the, the teams have been trying to uh, scramble and try to get the projects moving forward because they were demanded to do that. And uh, now it became more challenging for us because uh, we had to at the same time have an eye on them and uh, not on the actually what they are doing, but uh, making sure that uh, because of this rush, rush type of type of delivery, nothing is going to fall into the cracks, and then we uh, uh, over we can don't see what's happening in there. So yes, it, it it changed the way that we have been operating, and I think for the good reasons. And at the same time, it, it uh, showed that we can operate in this model as well, which is some kind of agile type of uh, work and. Uh, at the same time, the, the, the uh, attack breakthroughs and the attackers have not been sitting uh, and uh, doing nothing at the same time. And they were quite active too. And we had different type of ransomware coming all the way. And uh, it's not just about IT side, but even in the, the managed services that we have and the operations that we have at hospitals, then uh, uh, you, you can, uh, I think, if, uh, elaborate more on that. Uh, the, the technologies that we have in there, or uh, uh, basically the devices that we have at hospital, they become vulnerable at the same time. And that now it's not the perfect opportunity for uh, going through the back doors and side doors uh, through this type of technology. So uh, yeah, uh, yes, we, we, we experience that uh, difficult time definitely. All right. Uh, Daniel, did you have anything to add there? Or? Yeah, I just wanted to key off one thing that you said about, you know, the, the times of information security being the organization of no. Um, I, I personally, I, I don't think uh, they are ever the organization of no. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, one of the main pillars of governance is strategic alignment. And what that means is that the information security uh, objectives and goals and drivers should be driven by the business objectives and goals. F fundamentally, the reason why we exist is to, to support and enable the business. Well, when the business changes, information security has to adapt and adopt. We don't have a choice. So obviously, the business, in your example, or the, what we're all living through, it's changed in a fundamental manner. So the better question is, how do we pivot and continue to support and enable the business while at the same time, managing the risk to a level that is uh, acceptable and comfortable for the, for the business. 
Um, and like, I agree with you, anything that's public facing, uh, VPN, uh, network infrastructure, yeah, things like logging, alerting, patching, uh, 2FA, using uh, distributed denial service, uh, web application firewalls, prioritizing those critical vulnerabilities. Yeah, these are the things that, these are the types of controls that we have to implement. So we can ensure we can deliver the service that the business requires while at the same time keeping the risk to a level that is acceptable to the organization. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. Like, and I think I guess you're referring to a sort of, uh, they're more compensating controls is what they really are. Like, so you're not gonna, you know, make it the same risk posture as you would in non-pandemic mode where you where things were status quo. You have to bend a little bit and give a little bit of, uh, uh, leeway there, uh, but you're right. Uh, you you can doing those other compensating controls. You know the, the 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 monitoring, the patching, all that sort of thing. You can still limit the exposure to a somewhat acceptable level, and that's what kind of what we're doing. Uh, what with the approach that we've taken as well. Uh, no, this is great. Uh, so. Once the uh, once the pandemic had hit, uh, I don't know about you, and I think that uh, actually Ellie has some wonderful stats on this as well. Uh, the number of uh, you know phishing attempts uh, to clinicians, uh, business email compromise attempts as well uh, through our um, executive teams and well, appearing to come from our executive teams, as well as uh, you know uh, various research quote unquote research information that says you know. Uh, COVID-related uh, stats or that sort of thing have been coming in uh, through phishing uh, all over the place. And then I think that uh, I think that you, have, Ali, you had some, I guess, stats as, as actually percentages and, and numbers, quantities. But suffice it to say, I've seen a lot, too, in our organization as well. We've had to issue a number of uh, internal memos uh, to the rest of our staff to make them aware of it. Um, you know, uh, um, and how to sort of report those uh, those, those sorts of things, but uh, they have definitely uh, seen an increase and a spike uh, since the start of this uh, pandemic. So the, uh, the the hackers have definitely taken uh, interest in that. So Ali, maybe you want to comment on that? Sure. Yes, uh, we had the. You're right. We we, we saw a, a spike actually in the phishing attacks, and uh, that we were receiving. And targeting all the way uh, from the uh, executive team to the uh, uh, regular type of employees and uh, the staff on the ground. And uh, it, it was interesting, actually, that some of them were targeting some of the main uh, areas of interest, so, such as the PPE that we, we were battling and trying to uh, now acquire and get uh, because it became a part of the entire health, actually, uh, demand and task to, to go after that. And interestingly, we saw some of them coming, and they were very creative, actually, in the manner that they were coming in. And uh, still, we couldn't uh, catch them through our filters or whatever, but it became, at the end of the day, we had to come up with, as you mentioned, uh, some of the uh, awareness type of uh, the memos and trainings and sending out uh, multiple, basically, notifications to everyone, saying that, make sure that we are under attack and make sure that we know what you are doing and what you are opening, what you are clicking on. So uh, this became uh, one of the main jumping boards for, for the, uh, for the uh, attackers. And uh, again, mo as we can see, most of these are based on the fear factor that we are dealing with. And uh, especially when you are doing the uh, type of work that we are doing, and we have to deal with, uh, again, in under very uh, limited time and the aggressive timelines, we have to achieve some of this, then uh, as a Part of human factor and human uh, mentality, we usually omit and ignore the type of uh, precautious type of activities that we were doing in the past, because we are thinking that okay, we have to do it right away, uh, and that, that's how they use it. But and uh, absolutely, the phishing attack became one of the main. Uh, Why we had about 30, 40 percent uh, increase in the attacks and uh, the number of uh, phishing emails that we were receiving, uh, and which could target many different areas, including the ransomware type of uh, malware that could be attached to, the, to those uh, emails. Well, so uh, I think Huda, maybe uh, I think you've also done some research on the KPMG sites. So maybe you want to share some of your perspective as well. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so um, interestingly, the to predictions that they had for uh, 2020 uh, cyber attacks was that they, they didn't expect them to go actually up. They just uh, expected uh, cyber attacks to be more costly uh, in 2020. 
uh, when the pandemic hit, we saw, as Ali said, we saw a spike in uh, pandemic theme uh, attacks. Uh, and uh, so what I find very fascinating is that some uh, experts uh, believe that the total number of attacks have not actually gone up, just the, the focus of the attacks have been uh, shifted toward the pandemic and uh, mostly and also the healthcare sector. Uh, so um, this is what uh, threat actors, uh, they usually do for uh, phishing, and spear, spear phishing attacks, they're looking uh, at the news headlines. So what can provoke fear? What can provoke a sense of urgency? So in a pandemic cri crisis, there, there's no no surprise that this can this is going to be, uh, you know, leveraged as a lure to um, steal information and, um, you know, get uh, uh, steal uh, credentials. Um, the uh, the other interesting thing that, that we see in the uh, uh, you know, these uh, type of attacks. Uh, so, uh, for example, phishing has been used for dropping ransomware, but we see a new trend in the ransomware groups uh, uh, in a way that on top of uh, locking you out of your data and encrypting your data so that you cannot uh, access your data unless you pay the ransom, uh, they are actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, reaching your, their, uh, uh, stealing your information on top of that as well. So they um, uh, threaten you to leak your data and breach your data uh, when, uh, you know, if you don't pay the ransom. And uh, uh, recently some uh, new underground uh, uh, market places have been observed that are actually selling whole browsers of, uh, you know, users. So, uh, you know, those browsers, they include personal information, uh, work-related credentials. So as a result of the pandemic, since the many uh, workers, you know, including in healthcare and other companies, since they've been working uh, from home, as an, another example of some banded privacy and security rules, uh, uh, people had to rely on personal devices, bring your own devices or residential networks. So what has happened is that if uh, users use their personal devices to, uh, you know, access uh, corporate resources like uh, Office 365 or email, uh, and at the same time they use their personal email and they got, uh, uh, you know, they uh, gave up their um, information, their credentials uh, in a Netflix scam, uh, there was a chance that their browser was stolen and then it, it included that, you know, uh, work-related information and credential as well. So you could find those in the, uh, you know, dark web markets. Uh, so these are some of the, you know, critical kind of dangerous uh, trends uh, that uh, we've been seeing. Uh, and uh, the other uh, type of attacks uh, that we've been seeing are the, um, uh, attacks related to privileged access management and, uh, you know, uh, remote work uh, tools, actually, since, uh, you know, workers uh, moved to work from home, uh, organizations had to rely on a lot on backend admin tools and uh, network admin tools. So, uh, you know, so administrators are also working from home. It's not only regular users. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we've seen, you know, incidents, uh, the uh, most recent one being the uh, Twitter hack yeah. that, you know, uh, you coordinated social engineering of the, uh, some of their employees uh, resulted in the kind of the breach of some of their backend admin tools and resulted in uh, some high profile uh, account takeover. So this is, this is uh, one other thing that organizations have been uh, had to, you know, be very mindful about as uh, Ali and also as you also said, I think uh, in your organizations, uh, you've been trying to, uh, you know, mindful of how you're managing uh, admin accounts and uh, the other thing that our organizations can do to, uh, you know, deal with account takeover kind of and uh, breach of admin tools is, um, being uh, kind of uh, monitoring uh, mm, 
user behaviors to kind of uh, spot any abnormal behavior of the user and admin accounts. Great. So I think this together with the targeted attacks of the uh, you know, state-sponsored groups, so we can uh, discuss that a bit, maybe a bit more later. So I think all of these, the phishing, targeted attacks, and uh, backend admin tool like attacks, uh, and generally um, attacks related to, to re remote working tools or can kind of uh, you know, sum up the uh, main type of attacks that have been targeting healthcare during the pandemic. No, that's that's a, that's a great perspective. Thank you. Um, one of the things I guess uh, you know that we've sort of had to accelerate as well is this whole um, uh, sort of rethinking, uh, I guess, remote access, the way that we deliver remote access in general. Uh, you know, traditionally, you know, people are using the the old school sort of I call it old school, uh, you know, VPN technology where you need to be tethered at all times and that sort of thing. And uh, so, as part of this, uh, we've taken the opportunity to accelerate some of the um, uh, sort of the web-enabled, SaaS-enabled uh, services where you, you are uh, sort of not reliant on uh, coming in and, uh, and basically you can become somewhat device-independent um, uh, and so that the attack vector goes down so that you're not, you know, uh, a live, I call it live uh, um, IP address on your network, right? Uh, uh, maybe uh, I'll get Daniel to speak a little bit uh, to, is, is this a sort of trend that you guys are trying to look to as well? Because it, it, in and of itself, it, it sort of... Um, uh, sort of lessens the the risk factor for yourselves as well if you're if you're giving out uh, straight out VPN uh, for coming in over some sort of either a Citrix or a Webified uh, thing and then you're really you know sort of you're at arm's length if you will so uh, yeah. that's something that we've been working on at, at uh, UHN um, and even for clinical applications for 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 various you know diagnostic imaging and uh, and other types of uh, uh, applications we're trying to deliver them. Uh, where they don't have to actually come in to get to get that sort of thing. So, uh, Daniel, maybe you wanted to, to talk about your perspective of your organization. Sure. Um, so, I, just to pivot off something that Hoda said, the bad guys are attacking the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic from various angles, right? So, I'll give you a perfect example. In April 2020, Checkpoint said that they've noticed an uptick of about 30 percent of those coronavirus related to COVID-19 uh, attacks. In May, they estimated that a thousand new websites were created about COVID-19. And not just COVID-19 in general. There were general sites, then there were sites about the cure, there was sites about relief payments, and there were even sites about you know, life after COVID-19. So they are attacking kind of the pandemic from various angles. June 2020, the CryCryptor ransomware. So this was a ransomware that was specifically targeted people in Canada, Android users, uh, where there's a malicious app that was supposed to be a tracing app um, from Health Canada. So they certainly are uh, attacking the pandemic from various dimensions. So what are, what are some of the things we can do to combat this? To your point, um, instead of using things like VPNs, um, we can use other techno technical solutions, uh, for instance, such as VDIs or virtual desktop environments, uh, such as Citrix, where the person uh, still authenticates uh, to the organization and they're dropped into this, essentially a sandbox. And um, the only rights or privileges that they have can be cut down to just read access. There can be no data exfiltration. Um, and so that's one of the ways that we can control if they are using a device that happens to be um, compromised or other things, other controls that we can be put in place, but it's about isolating these people into a sandbox. And even in some cases, we can even scan, scan the machine before we even allow a connection. And if the machine doesn't meet a certain level of our criteria, whether it's patch level or any virus level, we actually take that machine and we can put it into another area of our network so it can get upgraded before we provide or allow it any access. No, and I, I think that this is what it is, because I think that in the new world now, I think uh, even after this whole thing blows over, uh, you know, the number of remote users is going to be still higher than it was before, much higher than it was before uh, long term. So I think that, uh, you know, remote access, what I'm trying to say is remote access is here to stay in a big way. So. Uh, yeah. 
So it's, it's going to be more, than, uh, uh, more of it rather than less, especially now with uh, the uh, clinicians trying to now deliver more, uh, I guess, uh, virtual care as well. Um, so that, that introduces a whole bunch of uh, sort of various over overriding privacy and things and that sort of thing, uh, regulations. So, uh, you know, the need to deliver things efficiently, securely, privately uh, uh, for live patient interaction as well. Uh, is definitely going to be uh, uh, big in the future. We, ourselves, we have a whole group uh, um, led by uh, an EVP who is the executive sponsor of it, uh, all around what are we doing about uh, virtual care. So uh, like it's definitely the big thing uh, from a healthcare perspective uh, uh, to be able to deliver this uh, efficiently. Uh, uh, Ali, actually, I'd like to uh, uh, learn a bit about more what uh, Ontario Health is doing on the uh, on the. Uh, virtual care side and, and, and their thoughts on it, your thoughts on it. Sure. Uh, well, uh, the, as others mentioned, the, uh, the challenge we have had is uh, VPN and the Citrix or whatever technology we are using for virtual connectivity to the working environment. That's, the, uh, again, the, the, there are two folks to this. One side is the virtual connectivity to the corporate side and the day-to-day the, the, the -day operation that we are doing. And the other one is the uh, patient side and the end users or the home care or uh, the care, ritual care delivery anyway at the, at the end. And uh, the, from, the, the, from the corporate side and the operation side, we have been challenged with the, of course, the increased number of the VPN connectivities or ritual and RDP into the environments that we have had. And as Hoda and uh, Daniel mentioned at the same time that our administrators are also working from home, the IT administrators, and they needed to access the environments and the, the work remotely from home. So all of these introduce new uh, basic uh, attack vectors and platforms and opportunities to the, to the attacker, especially going after the well, existing vulnerabilities within the those type of tools that we have had in-house, in, in such as the, the, the VPN solutions that we have, or the Citrix vulnerabilities existing ones, or the new ones that they came out uh, later on. So. Uh, now we saw that more uh, scanned against our environments uh, or public facing type of uh, IPs that are uh, out there uh, going after such vulnerabilities and show them came back with some of them and received uh, multiple reports that they, uh, they have been able to uh, identify some of those existing vulnerabilities and started trying exploiting them and trying to get into the back doors from them. Now and carry the uh, whatever activity they want to include in the ransomware that we are talking about. And uh, Hodor is correct. And the challenge we face actually, and we saw it in Europe actually, we, that we got involved because they were one of the parent companies providing uh, some sort of service to us in Canada. Uh, we had the case that the ransomware actually that they, they attacked them uh, exfiltrated some of the data. And now at that stage, it's different volume, something more about recovery of the. Uh, the, the work is about now we are dealing with uh, actual selling the data and exfiltration of the data that can uh, be leaked and uh, be sold under the, uh, the, the dark web or whatever they are uh, using for that. So uh, th those factors from that aspect, we have from, from again the operation side. Now from the, the actual uh, care delivery part, we, we were facing the same type of challenge because not only are team members need to deliver the, the, the care virtually to the, to the patients that are, are needed to stay home and the, or uh, remotely. At the same time, the patient side, if you look at it, that became another challenge because, again, now patients who are not usually tech savvy type of people, they are dealing with different type of, uh, again, the fear factor. And uh, we, we had to make sure that they are aware of how they are operating and how they are virtually accessing or providing their information because they became perfect target for the attackers that now they could attack them directly by sending them an email saying that, you know what, this is from a uh, hospital or from whatever service provider that they were uh, receiving for a uh, service and uh, they, they just get into the phishing type of attacks or whatever else that they, they, they might get into. So all of those became a combination of different type of uh, attack uh, vectors and attack challenges that we had to deal with both from operation side and again the, 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 the service delivery side for the patients. That's great. Uh, I think we do have some questions from uh, the audience. I'm just going to read, uh, I guess, one of them out. Uh, we are uh, receiving them here. 
Uh, so are the attacks coming from specific countries? I guess maybe this is a uh, good question for Huda. I guess she does a lot of this uh, um, uh, sort of analysis. Uh, so like, are there specific countries that are actually uh, targeting things, or are they coming out of a specific nation state? Or is there just is it general overall? Maybe you can start with that. Um, yeah, just to make sure that I understand the question correctly. So they're asking which countries are targeting uh, healthcare, or which countries are being targeted. Uh, which ones are uh, are the attacks coming from? So like, which ones are, oh. are doing the attacking? Okay. Um, so so in terms of the nation states and uh, state sponsored actors. I think what they call it right now is, uh, so it's another term that I have coined, uh, but I find it very interesting. So they call it vaccine race, a parallel yeah. to um, yes, yes. You know, space race or arms race. Yeah. So uh, what is uh, very important right now is which uh, country is going to be the first country that uh, can develop a working vaccine. Yes. So it can uh, help them to, you know, it can help them strategically help their government, uh, government and the, you know, position of power. And it can also help them economically uh, to relieve some of the um, effects of the pandemic. So uh, that's why uh, nation state uh, actors are actively they have shifting their focus toward vaccine research. And uh, as I uh, mentioned before, so these are not new trends or new types of attacks. Just a pandemic has uh, shifted their focus and, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of has only uh, impacted the trends that were there before. So, for example, uh, nation states that were uh, interested in influencing U.S. election before, they're now interested in, uh, you know, and stealing uh, vaccine uh, development information. Uh, so, and we've had uh, some advisories from FireEye and from uh, different uh, intelligence agencies on the, uh, you know, threats from, you know, I mean, the, the, the threat actors that have been there, like, I don't know, China, Russia, and uh, that, you know, they're now targeting um, uh, US, Canada, and, uh, UK uh, vaccine research. So this is the latest, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, kind of threat advisory that I've uh, noticed. Uh, so yeah, so that's the thing. So the nation states, they're actually, uh, they're uh, working in the, uh, you know, interest of their govern governance. So right now their governance are interested in this. So they have changed their focus uh, to this. And the interesting about uh, nation states attacks and targeted attacks is that Although they can be very complex, but uh, they're not usually uh, using very complex uh, attacks. I mean, they can um, go undetected for some time. They can do that, but uh, most of the time they're just using very common uh, attack types. They're they're just repurposing existing ransomware or yeah. using some existing techniques. So. Uh, healthcare companies, by just going back to the basics, having some, uh, uh, you know, basic security hygiene, uh, like uh, reviewing their security posture and using VPN, using multi-factor authentication, being mindful about their um, file sharing tools and uh, admin accounts, things like that. If they do these basics, they can protect themselves against most of the attacks, the targeted attacks. Yeah, I think that's. Uh, I think you hit it right there. Uh, so recently, I think you're referring to the uh, the advisory that did come out to uh, with the. Uh, I think Russia was looking for uh, various uh, vaccine information, and they're targeting. Uh, research right. facilities uh, across, and then, so we did receive the same advisory, uh, and uh, yeah, and it was uh, it was specifically around the research side. So we had to actually uh, remind our researchers uh, about various uh, you know usual hygiene and, and security awareness and that sort of thing. We did our due diligence around the patching and the testing and stuff. But yes, you're right, uh, it is, and I liked how you coined it. I guess a uh, vaccine race, and that's really what it is. Is like they're looking for that, so that's kind of what is motivating them. Uh, uh, to to attack these research facilities, so that's great. Uh, we have yeah, a couple, couple. So I so sorry, just a quick thing. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you've received those advisors. So the other thing that I wanted to point out uh, is you know industry and government uh, collaboration, receiving and sharing information. 
uh, these institutions uh, so it can help you know healthcare uh, yeah, institutions no. receive custom uh, threat intel so they can be aware of these. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I think that there's, uh, Ontario Health is doing a good job as well. I think that there's, uh, I'm not sure if it's Ontario Health or it's Ministry of Health who, who sends out uh, the, the overall, I guess there's uh, various emergency advisories that come out. I receive them as well myself on various uh, um, uh, vulnerabilities that have uh, impacted Ontario hospitals or, or health organizations. Uh, once one of someone has one, uh, then it comes out to the rest of the uh, the hospitals and, and the, uh, the executive teams are, uh, informed of that so that they can go back to their organization and say, hey, you know, do we have this, uh, are we still vulnerable to this sort of thing as well? So, uh, yeah, to your point about sharing, uh, I guess sharing is caring, you know, uh, kindergarten principles, right? True. <laughs> uh, Especially for uh, healthcare. Right, so that, that is, uh, that, that's kind of uh, what is being done here. Uh, I, I know we're, I'm being sensitive to time, so we get, still got a couple questions to get to, uh, and, uh, you know, the discussion has been great so far. Um, so uh, are there concerns about uh, telehealth and digital delivery of healthcare to, uh, to the home? So uh, I think this really refers to about, uh, I think they're talking about maybe security or privacy concerns around uh, telehealth and digital delivery of healthcare. So uh, basically I think they're asking is, can we do this safely and efficiently and privately? Um, so maybe uh, thoughts and perspectives from anyone, uh, maybe uh, Daniel or Ellie. I might be able to, to uh, elaborate on that a bit uh, because I've been involved actually in the telehealth type of uh, discussion and uh, the, the delivery. You are right. We have had this uh, around for many years, but uh, we had to ramp it up again and uh, we, uh, we had to actually bring more uh, uh, teams into the game in order to, especially when it came to the COVID-19 uh, testing uh, results and informing people and getting back to, to, to people. and. Uh, the, the reality is that uh, nothing is safe in this world. No, we cannot say, <laughs> we know that the risk always is there. But whether telehealth is good, uh, in, a, in a good shape to, to deliver and uh, what they have been doing or OTN that has been uh, uh, basically uh, also the frontliner for providing the virtual uh, 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 solutions for uh, the virtual uh, deliveries. Uh, the reality is that I, I think so, yes, based on what we have seen and what we have experienced so far, and uh, what has been put in place, because the needed due diligence have been done, and the Ministry of Health actually has been directly managing that uh, telehealth uh, 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 operation, and uh, by working with the vendors who are providing that service. And based on the activities that we have had, and as I said, I, I've been involved actually directly in a couple of them, uh, every telehealth, uh, they, they, they have the needed uh, at the end of the day, human factor is the case here, and uh, there might be human errors in leaking data or when you talk about privacy side of it. And, but the operation has been put together and procedures have uh, put, been put together, I believe, in the way that uh, it's going to prevent uh, as much as possible such, uh, such uh, errors. But uh, in general, they, they, have it, uh, in, uh, they have their operation under control, and uh, we can rely on that uh, somehow. And uh, we know that it's working so far. Okay. Uh, Daniel, do you have anything to add or all this? Or? No, that was fantastic. Okay, okay, great. Um, uh, I think the next question we have out here is, uh, do members of our healthcare security teams uh, in the public sector collaborate and share information and resources? I think we touched on this a little bit before. I guess there are advisories that go out. But aside from the advisories, um, uh, there are sessions as well, I guess, um, uh, they're more, I call them informal, but uh, as a, in my CISO community as well, I've got, uh, you know, um, I guess either CISOs or directors of security, or whatever, from the other uh, uh, hospitals that are out there, I guess the organizations that, you know, the, uh, the, the Trilliums, the, uh, the, the other organizations, uh, Hamlet Health Sciences, all these other ones. Uh, a lot of the forums like this, the Cyber Exchange and other, other forums, uh, uh, are great uh, areas to collaborate. I do collaborate uh, with the rest of my uh, counterparts and my peers um, just through, uh, through other channels. And, uh, you know, we have email threads. We have other uh, group chats as well uh, on various advisories. Is it, uh, is, it, is it as good as it could be? Probably not. I mean, it could be more formalized, for sure. Uh, right now, it's, it's, I'll call it maybe informal at this point. But... Uh, but there is a big appetite, and I think that um, 
Uh, you know, I think Ontario Health is also leading some of this as well uh, to get um, uh, this because really the larger hospitals, in a, uh, especially I'm speaking only about Ontario, but uh, um, you know there are these larger facilities, uh, you know, these teaching hospitals like SF are well funded, and they can afford you know um, you know the coolest sim, the uh, the fanciest knack, and this and that, right? And they can maybe protect themselves pretty well. It's the ones that you're worried about. I think we had, there was a breach uh, uh, late last year uh, uh, with uh, London Health and some of the smaller sites out, out in uh, southwestern Ontario. Uh, and uh, it's, long story short, it's just because they can't afford uh, the kind of security that they need, right? Uh, it's not that they don't want to. Um, they just, their budgets are small, they're constrained. Um, and so there is an, uh, an idea there that um, perhaps the, we can you know, share some of our uh, uh, technologies that we have in place and maybe, uh, you know, come up with some sort of a model uh, to, to share with those because really, I mean, uh, you need to have a uniform level of security across everybody, all on it doesn't, it's not, it's not helpful where, you know, the big hospitals, they're all super secure when the ones that are, like, the regional hospitals are not, like, it doesn't make sense. So, uh, I don't know, Ali, if you have any perspectives on that. Sure. Uh, yes, the, you, you said it right, actually. Uh, of course, uh, there is always room for improvement, and more collaboration is always appreciated. Uh, uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, we are dealing with a, a broad uh, area of uh, operation, uh, all the way hospital to the different agencies, different type of service providers. There are some initiatives going on right now that we are working on, and we are trying to uh, uh, manage it and bring pro probably more collaboration uh, uh, Within the players in the sector, and uh, the, an, an example of that, we have multiple committees going on uh, across province that are working on different ones, but uh, related to even let's say monitoring and uh, basically uh, managing services. Now we are thinking that we can co uh, collaborate more with uh, even hospitals, and uh, uh, for example, from Ontario Health point of view, and we provide that type of service. And you're right, the ministry has been. Uh, proactive, uh, the Ministry uh, of Health so far, and since the, this uh, pandemic has started and all of the new attacks that we saw on the sector, we have been receiving the advisory ones. At the same time, uh, at Ontario Health, we have, for instance, we have a, a, a threat in health uh, service that we, we, we run, and uh, we, uh, all of the service providers pretty much, including some hospitals, have been receiving the advisory reports from us, and uh, mm -hmm. we are trying to Make sure that everyone is aware and that is their factor again, and they they they, they are uh, going to work together in order. But uh, budget has been always the challenge. Of course, uh, it's, again, we are talking about uh, government operation, and uh, we always have been uh, dealing with that uh, uh, the budgetary type of uh, challenges. But there, as I said, there, there is definitely lots of room for improvement and bringing everyone together. Make sure that we have a. Uh, Unified, basically, defense mechanism in place, rather than having it in silos. Okay, uh, so this this hour has flown by. I mean, the, and the, the discussion has been so great. We are down to like five minutes left. Uh, I do have one last question here, and maybe Daniel can uh, can step in on this one. Uh, what are some of the financial impacts to our security budgets in light of the pandemic? So, from your perspective, uh, you know, running your the CDW's organizations, and has there been any? Uh, um, Issues with your with your budgetary? Have you been reduced? Have you been given a green light to go and spend? Like, uh, uh, what has happened to you, uh, so far since the pandemic has started, Daniel? Financially, we go the way that our clients go and our customers go. So, as our customers and our clients have suffered, um, so has we. So have we. So, there are obviously areas of our organization that are doing extremely well. Uh, such as the area of our organization that serve, um, you know, K-12 and delivering technology to schools. And obviously with all the people working home now, there's been a massive uptick in people needing kind of endpoint devices, web cameras, uh, he like uh, uh, headphones. But obviously there are other areas of our organization where if we have less demand from customers or if our customers or clients are scaling back on the projects that they want to implement, then and that's obviously going to affect us. Um, so I, I would say, yeah, it kind of depends on the, on the organization. For us, yeah, I mean, everybody's suffering. I, I especially feel for a lot of those uh, solopreneurs or kind of the small business, a large percentage of those people 
um, are, are probably not going to survive, and, and a large percentage of people have, have already gone under. And I think it's awful. And I think the longer that this pandemic goes on, um, potentially the larger the impact is going to be to kind of all of us um, from a financial point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, no, and from my perspective, I guess really what we've had is uh, uh, the um, some of the security spends have actually have gone gone the other way, where it's like. Uh, Due to the remote access and due to the remote uh, working, uh, for example, I'll, I'll use the example of, uh, so we rolled out Microsoft Teams, we, had a, uh, we have it half deployed, and then we accelerated, we f found money to accelerate the rest of the deployment and get, get the rest of the licenses quickly uh, to get them all out. So it's things that needed to get done, uh, you know, money was somehow suddenly appeared to make it happen, right, from, from a business perspective. Uh, also, things like, uh, you know, we were my, right into another Citrix environment, new Citrix environment to allow clinical access. That was planned for the fall, and then all, all of a sudden it was accelerated to, uh, to ensure that they were able to get that out uh, uh, to respond to the pandemic. So things that, I guess maybe to your point, I guess before about, uh, about business-driven, it was business-driven. It's like, we need to have, make it yeah. happen now. So it's like, yeah, you know, we'll do it in three months. It's like, no, you'll have it delivered in two weeks, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, whatever you need to make it happen, do it. So, uh, so yeah. when it was like that, yeah. So what I would say is, my organization uh, we've adopted cloud first for many years. Yeah. So we didn't have that kind of challenge, but a challenge that many organizations definitely had was uh, through capacity issues. So if you get you know a massive percentage of your workforce who are starting to use WebEx and, and Citrix, um, in some cases you actually didn't have the back end infrastructure to support. Uh, the amount of people that were connecting to work. Um, so I would say definitely that's something that I've read a lot about were, that a lot of organizations have struggled with. And there was a hump that those organizations needed to, to get over. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, anyone else, uh, Huda or uh, uh, Ali, do you have any perspectives on the, on the budgetary side of things? We have three minutes left. Otherwise, what we could do is uh, we could just have a, maybe a last-minute uh, wrap-up, I guess, maybe closing remarks from all four of us, maybe you can have a closing remark. Uh, how do you see how you see the pandemic? I guess uh, 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 ending off in the next uh, next few uh, months or whatever, and what's it, what's it going to look like in the future? Everyone's got let me be a minute, a minute each. So go ahead, Ali. Sure, uh, just answering your question about the budgetary point. Uh, the reality is that you're, you're right. We got some maybe additional funding right away for for the operation side. But from the security side, uh, we pretty much remain the same when we talk about that because, uh, and we have been able to, to manage it, to be honest, uh, from the uh, healthcare sector part, because I, I believe it, we had to optimize some of the work that we were doing to make sure that uh, we, and while we were shifted some of the focus toward a specific type of uh, attacks that we were receiving, all of that. But at the end of the day, pretty much it has remained the same so far, and we haven't seen such a big increase, which we hope. So, but we haven't seen it yet. Uh, when it comes to the, uh, the the next few months, to be honest, I think it's going to be an ongoing trend. And now, the, the, Daniel mentioned about the, the, the website that they have been uh, the, basically put together in the past few months related to the COVID-19. They are going to continue, and this is not going to end soon. And the, 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 the contents are going to just change. Right now, for example, it's going to be more focused on the cure part and the vaccine and they are going to come back with those type of uh, basic uh, attack uh, uh, factors and vectors uh, against. So this is going to be an ongoing battle. This is not going to end. This is not going to be mm -hmm. something that we are going to uh, see. Uh, we are going to have rest. The reality is that we have to have our guard all built up and make sure that we have it and improve it. Actually, we have to raise the bar. We cannot lower the bar because that's not what our attackers are doing. They are becoming more sophisticated. And unfortunately, we are dealing with some of the, even the security type of attackers that now using the the, the, uh, the tools that are available to them for free, uh, or they pay for it. Ransom as a service, for example, has become mm -hmm. really a type of uh, uh, service going on. And many of these, they gave the opportunity to some of these people who are staying at home, try to play around and become more active and in this domain. So uh, this is an ongoing battle, and we are going to fight, have this fight for a bit. Uh, pretty much. Okay, uh, Huda, you got uh, maybe 30 to 40 seconds to uh, summarize okay, the sure. last thing. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, uh, that's, 
you know, uh, the lockdown and the pandemic so far has been a real test of business continuity plans for many organizations. Uh, so based on the lessons learned that uh, they've got from this, now it's time to review and uh, update their business continuity plans uh, for, you know, now that businesses are going back to normal and, uh, the, you know, uh, after the, uh, what's happening after the lockdown. Uh, a couple of trends are uh, here to stay for sure. Uh, one is accelerations, uh, acceleration of digital transformation. The other one is uh, remote work for, workforce and going from home, uh, you know, working from home. So, uh, I, yeah, I recommend healthcare organizations to have these in mind and you know work more on securing their remote access uh, uh, tools. You know, uh, work on their uh, cloud uh, projects uh, and so on, have, and have these in mind uh, for updating their business continuity plans. Awesome, thank you. Uh, sorry, Daniel, we'll be able to get to you at, uh, as we're wrapping up here now. But uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us in this, uh, in this first opening session. On behalf of Ali, uh, Daniel, and Huda, uh, I'd like to thank you for attending. Goodbye.